So predictive coding. Um, I like to think of predictive coding as Pandora radio, going back to my music analogy. So if you think about it, the best Pandora radio station is the one that you yourself personally have spent a lot of time making better. So you go through and you type in an artist and we'll give you a song and you have to say thumbs up or thumbs down. And based on that decision, it gives you more songs, right? And so I can't have my husband do my, you know, my Pandora radio station. He might think he knows that one, but really he doesn't. So you have to have a subject matter expert, right? To go through so that they can really understand what is needed. So I like to, to think about uh, Pandora radio as um, predictive coding. So that's why I was just going to away from Atlanta. But. So um, again, there's judicial recognition of predictive coding. I think there's upwards of 13 written opinions. They may not all be about specifically the protocols, but you know, suggestions for using it. Um, Judge Peck mentioned Gabriel Technologies, which I think was pretty interesting because uh, the, the court actually awarded fees uh, to the uh, prevailing party um, for predictive coding. Um, so this is the Computer Assisted Review Reference Model put together by the EDRM. It is uh, very helpful in understanding the different components of a predictive coding process. Um, and so as you're going through, you should at the outset of your project or your document review, really understand each of these components and how they play into um, how you're going to move forward with your document review predictive coding protocol. So the first thing you need to understand are what are your goals? So Judge Peck alluded to this earlier, that you can use it as an exclusionary tool. So that means that you would go through playing the system after you completed your iterations and you've done your quality control. The documents that are not predicted to be responsive will not be reviewed further and they will not be produced. Okay, so that's the exclusionary um, option. You can also use it as an organization tool where the documents that are predicted to be responsive go to the review team first. You use additional technology. Um, so you still would want a concept cluster. You still would want to use email threading to provide further efficiency. So those go to your team first. You may be more experienced reviewers. Then the documents that are coded or predicted to be not responsive could go to a different team. They could go to a very senior attorney who can quickly go through and confirm the accuracy of those predictions. Um, a lot of clients, uh, or many of our clients, are not ready to use it as an exclusionary tool. However, they are very happy to use it as an organizational tool because it does provide significant cost savings because the amount of time that it's required to go through the non-responsive documents, because if you think about it, if you're going through non-responsive documents continuously, you're not having to code for anything but to confirm that it's not responsive. So you go through this much quicker than if you're having to go back and forth between responsive and not responsive and making confidentiality calls and privilege calls. Your mind is just in a better position to quickly go through those documents. It's also a good tool to use for the analysis of documents that are produced to you. And so a lot of people um, really don't think about that when they're drafting their ESI protocols and negotiating that early on in the case. So if you think that that is potential for your document collection and that your documents will be produced to you, you should consider what metadata, what information is necessary to be produced to you so that you can utilize it most cost effectively and not require your vendor to go through the additional reprocessing of the data to make it useful um, in the predictive coding environment. It is also very good for pre-production final quality uh, control checks. We certainly use it for privilege checks. Um, there is debate as to whether you should use it for coding privilege, um, but it's certainly useful to pass documents that may have slipped through the review process and have been coded as not privileged. Um, it's a good check for um, Issue tagging. So, if you have a group of documents that have been identified as a specific issue tag, you can run those issue tags with this population to see if there's additional documents that, that um, need to be coded to that issue tag. That's very important 
when you're producing to the government and you have um, a request where you have to produce it instead of the request, so that could be a good quality control check there. So protocol considerations. Um, <laughs>